It's a new year and a new chance for you to make a fresh start with your compliance. For the next 31 days on the FCPA Compliance Report, we're going to be bringing you a daily tip, strategy, or idea that you can use to improve your program. Here's your host, Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist. Day 8, Internal Controls and Compliance. What are internal controls? The best definition I've come across is from Jonathan Marks, who defined internal controls as, an internal control is an action or processes of interlocking activities designed to support the policies and procedures detailing the specific preventative, detective, corrective, directive, and collaborative actions required to achieve the desired process outcomes or objectives. This, along with continuous auditing, continuous monitoring, and training, reasonably assures the achievement of process objectives linked to to the organization's objectives, the operational efficiency and effectiveness, reliable books and records, compliance with laws, regulations, and policies, and the reduction of risk, fraud, waste, abuse, which aids in the decline of process and policy variation, leading to more predictive outcomes. What specific internal controls should there be in a compliance program? Well, they are the foundation of any anti-corruption compliance program, and the starting point is the FCPA itself, which requires issuers to devise and maintain a system of internal controls which can reasonably assure, number one, that transactions are executed in accordance with management's general or specific authorization. Number two, transactions are recorded necessary to permit preparation of financial statements in conformity with generally accepting accounting principles or other criteria applicable to such statement, and maintain accountability for assets. Three, access to assets is permitted only in accordance with management's general or specific authorization. And four, the recorded accountability for assets is compared with the existing assets at reasonable intervals and appropriate action is taken with respect to any differences. The DOJ and SEC in the 2012 guidance stated, internal controls over financial reporting and the processes by which companies to provide reasonable assurances regarding the reliability of financial reporting and the preparation of financial statements. They include various components, such as a control environment that covers the tone set by the organization regarding ethics and integrity, risk assessments, control activities that cover policies and procedures designed to ensure that management directives are carried out, information and communications, and monitoring. The designation of a company's internal controls must take into account the operational realities and risks attendant to the company's business, such as its nature of products, services, how the products and services get to market, the nature of its workforce and the degree of regulation, the extent of its government interaction, the degree to which its operations in countries with a high risk of corruption. This was supplemented in the 2019 guidance with a pair of pointed questions whether the company has made significant investigation into its internal controls and have they been tested, then remediated based on the testing. The whole concept of internal controls is that companies need to focus on where the risks, compliance, and otherwise may be, and they need to allocate their limited resources to putting controls in place that address those risks. In the compliance world, of course, your two big risks are, number one, company assets or resources will be used to pay a bribe, and two, the diversion of company assets, such as unauthorized sales discounts and receivables and write-offs, which could be used to pay a bribe. There are four significant controls for the compliance practitioner to implement initially. They are, number one, delegation of authority, number two, maintenance of the vendor master list, number three, contracts with third parties, and number four, movement of cash and currency. Your delegation of authority should reflect the impact of compliance risk including both transactions and geographic location, so that a higher level of approval for matters involving third parties for fund transfers and invoice payments to countries outside the U.S. would be required inside your organization. Next is the vendor master file, which can be a powerful preventative control, largely because payments to fictitious vendors are one of the most common occupational frauds. The vendor master should also be structured so that each vendor can be identified not only at the risk level, but also by date on which the vetting was completed and the vendor received final approval. There should be electronic controls in place to block payments for any vendor for which vetting has not been approved. 
Internal controls are needed over the submission, approval, and input of changes into the vendor master file. Contracts with third parties can be an effective control that works to prevent nefarious conduct rather than simply acting as a detect control. For contracts to provide effective internal controls, however, relevant terms of those contracts, including, for instance, the commission rate, reimbursement of business expenses, and use of subagents should be available to the, those who process and approve vendor invoices. All situations involving the movement of cash or transfer of monies outside the U.S., including such methods as computer checks, manual checks, wire transfers, replenishment of petty cash, loans, and advances should be reviewed from the compliance risk standpoint. This means identifying the ways in which a country manager or self-manager could cause funds to be transferred to their control and to conceal the true nature of the funds within the accounting system. To prevent these types of activities, internal controls need to be in place. All wire transfers outside the U.S. should have defined approvals in the delegation of authority. The persons who execute the wire transfers should be required to evidence agreement of the approvals to the delegation of authority and wire transfer requests going out of the United States should also require dual approvals. Lastly, wire transfer requests going outside the U.S. should be required to include a description of proper business purpose. The bottom line is that internal controls are just good financial controls. The internal controls that are detailed for third-party representatives in the compliance context would help to detect fraud, which could well lead to bribery and corruption. As an exercise, you should map your existing internal controls to the 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program or some other well-known anti-corruption regime to see where the control gaps may exist at your organization. This will help you determine whether adequate compliance internal controls are present in your company. From there, you can move to see if they are working in place. So what are today's three key takeaways? Well, number one, always remember that effective internal controls are mandated by the FCPA and you can be prosecuted civilly for not having effective controls in place and it can be quite costly. Two, effective, excuse me, internal controls are a critical part of any best practices compliance program and every compliance practitioner needs to familiarize themselves with your company's internal controls. And finally, the four significant controls for the compliance practitioner to implement initially. These include the delegation of authority, maintenance of the vendor master file, contracts with third parties, and movement of cash and currency outside of your organization. This is Tom Fox. I hope you've enjoyed day eight of 31 days to a more effective compliance program. I hope you'll join me again tomorrow and I take up another strategy, tactic, or pointer that you can use in your compliance program. 31 days to a more effective compliance program is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.